He's going to kill me. Please, let's open the door. Hi, I'm Jez, I'm a film and TV director, and I'm going to talk about what worked and what didn't in Apple TV's Hijack. So first I'm going to talk about the stuff that was really good, and then talk about the things that, in my opinion, made it quite a frustrating watch. So what was the best thing about it? Well, the premise. It's basically 24 on a plane. Only our protagonist isn't Jack Bauer or John McClane, because he's a negotiator, not a fighter. Can he save the plane with words, not fists? Let me tell you where I'm at with this, all right? And this is a really bold choice from Idris Elba, to choose a star vehicle where he doesn't play an immediately likeable character from the start, and is by no means your standard action hero. I mean, he loses a fight against an old man, despite even giving him concussion first. Perhaps it's a reaction to the I'm Idris Elba, I can do anything whole thing. I'm Idris Elba. Bit, 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 bit. I'm a director, DJ, producer, and I'm a cat. So I'm pretty sure I can cure one or two deadly illnesses. What else was done well? Well, the production value was top class, every technical department is on top form, particularly production design and cinematography. Plane sets have a habit of looking a little bit creaky and fake, but this one looks bang on, particularly the cockpit, which is often hard to get right. Why use a set rather than a real plane? Well, if you can afford it, always build a set. You'll have total control over the lighting environment and can slide rows of seats and bulkheads out of the way for complex camera moves or blocking. And this contributes to the camera team doing a great job of making this tricky environment look beautiful. Well, that's what I ask. Going back to the story, there's a high level of tension held throughout, although I'm going to come back to that because there's another side to the way they achieve it. And the action on the ground is generally pretty well connected, so that once we're past the first couple of episodes, it doesn't feel like we're cutting away to unrelated jeopardy. It all has to be tied into the primary threat, and generally speaking, it is. In keeping with the character design of the protagonist, there's also a very intentional choice to make the passenger's behaviour realistic. Their response to a somewhat underwhelming bunch of hijackers is predominantly determined by fear and self-interest. Okay, this is our chance. Is that the I can do it? Now, let's talk about what didn't work, in my opinion, at least. I don't know if I'm in the minority here, I think I might be actually, but I found Hijack quite a frustrating watch. And a quick word on potentially a conflicting interest. Personally, I've had a screenplay called Last Flight in development in LA for a few years. It got as far as table reads, but never quite got off the ground. And rather than sour grapes, I really do want to celebrate everything that does get made, because I know how bloody hard it is. So I'm not coming into this bitter that mine didn't go and Hijack did. But I have done my aviation research and faced many of the narrative challenges that this kind of story throws up, so I hope I've got some insight. And I've also thought long and hard about whether it's appropriate for me to be critical of projects that people I know worked on, especially when you don't know the particular budgetary, scheduling or practical hurdles they had to jump through, let alone the executive or network notes on a story level. Because the fact remains that anything even vaguely watchable has to get 900 things out of a thousand right for it to even hold your attention. Something really spectacular might get 995 things right. In that scenario, the five it didn't are A, subjective, and may B, have been impossible to avoid in any case. So it's pretty churlish to sit up on an ivory tower and pretend you know better when you may well not have got those 900 basics right yourself. So all of that said, and with congratulations to everyone involved on the project for it being a commercial and critical success with an 86% Rotten Tomatoes score, here goes. Let's start with research, because that's where all writing has to start. And there's four topics that I would start with on a project like this. Firstly, flight crew response protocols to hijacking type incidents, ground staff and air traffic control protocols to hijacking incidents, government response protocols, and organised crime patterns, behaviours and capabilities. And in Hijack, it doesn't feel like that research has been done particularly well, or it's been ignored in favour of easy plot points. I spoke to the pilot, said it was nothing. 
What if he's lying? Why would he lie? Maybe he was threatened. I won't illustrate examples for all of these as it would make this vid an hour long, but research is absolutely critical to making any drama feel authentic. That authenticity is why The Wire is one of the best TV shows ever. But you don't need to have been an ex-cop to write a cop show, you just need to have done your homework. And it also doesn't need to be so authentic that every single pilot would be nodding their head whilst watching. Pilots are probably 0.01% of the audience, and you can take the odd liberty. But you definitely want to put the script, or at least story, past one first as a sense check. Captain speaking. Fundamentally, there's a reasonable level of authenticity you need to reach, as it actually generates more story possibilities rather than restricting them. You can take the factors that help your story and do a little sideways dance around the ones that don't. Let's take Oscar winner Gravity. Did astrophysicists note that some rather huge liberties were taken with the various orbit technicalities involved? Yes. Did it matter? No, because to 99.9% .9 of the audience, including space nerds like me, it felt authentic enough. And for me, Hijack doesn't clear or even get close enough to that bar. Someone done something to these. How does this issue manifest? Fundamentally in people and systems behaving in ways that don't feel real. And as a result, disconnect us from the story. The Prime Minister decides. No, she acts on advice. The decision is ours. Very much like the next issue, where characters behave irrationally or illogically because the plot needs something to happen. They want access to the cockpit. Do you need hijackers in the cockpit? Great, let's generate a scenario that enables it and then completely ignore the character consequences for the next six episodes. Over the windows, they've gone. Do not open the jets have gone. Stop. Need jeopardy with Idris's kid? Yeah, no need for him to get the hell out of Dodge through the door and over the balcony. Just stay in the cupboard, because the bad guys with guns definitely won't look in there. Also, what 18-year-old would know where the landline socket in the house they grew up in is, let alone the one in their dad's new house? In my notes on the show, I've got literally five glaring examples of this per episode, but I'm not going to bore you with them all right now. Where is she? Go up, sir. I'm meant to get a tissue. So, the next issue I'd like to talk about. One of the critical components in thriller writing is the unspoken contract between the filmmakers and the audience concerning the relationship between suspense, tension, and information. Someone like the Mission Impossible writer-director Chris McQuarrie understands this implicitly. In the excellent Filmmakers podcast with Giles Alderson and Don Lenoir, he discusses how whilst reshooting Ghost Protocol, they fine-tuned the editing whilst intercutting between concurrent action scenes. Certain kind of fight scenes you have to return to after 10 to 15 seconds. But let's say Ethan Hunt's following someone down an alley, well, you can cut to another scene for 25 or 30 seconds without breaking that contract of tension and suspense with the audience. And in Hijack, the tension is primarily created through withholding information. But time and again, there is a creative and intentional decision, either by writers, director, editor, or some combination thereof, to push the boundaries of that contract beyond the usual limits. Whether on a micro level, like revealing the bullet in episode one, which makes us wait three beats too long. Maybe we should wait. Keep it low key, yeah? or a macro level, like the information about why the hijackers are hijacking the plane, which comes three episodes too late. And dare I say it, it's kind of annoying to watch. And the thing is, the right information creates tension all by itself, so it's a bit of a cheap trick to withhold it just for the sake of it. I mean, that's what we were told to do, and we do what they want always. Here's the next issue. It's fairly standard convention, especially in the thriller genre, to have what we call an active protagonist. Basically, the hero is driving the story forwards, for better or worse, through their own actions. So in film land, think John McClane. In TV land, think Jack Bauer. But in Sam Nelson, we've got a strangely passive protagonist. I get that he's a talker, not a fighter, and that's a nice take on the genre. I just want to get home. But for long periods, he doesn't even do much talking. The first time his special skills as a negotiator actually drive the story forwards is in episode four, where he manipulates Lewis into calling his mum and gets a message down to the ground himself. That's a really long time to wait to give us the promise of the premise. 
In a movie, the promise of the premise would normally come early in act two, so perhaps half an hour in. But here we have to wait three and a half or four hours to get there. And yes, sometimes protagonists and thrillers can be on the receiving side of action rather than driving the story forwards themselves. But generally, this involves really fucking the protagonists over, not just zip tying their hands and letting them wander around a plane. What's the result of having your protagonist be this passive? Ultimately, again, it becomes a frustrating watch as it hinders the audience's ability to engage with the hero as well as affecting the pace of the show itself. And this passiveness isn't a necessary function of him not being a fighter. Look at the second half of Executive Decision, in which Kurt Russell's intelligence analysis gets properly involved despite being out of his depth. In my opinion, that's how you manage this kind of talking protagonist with hugely escalating stakes on a plane. Second half in particular of that film is really good and definitely worth a rewatch, by the way. It's not over. It's over. Finally, I'm not going to list the numerous plot holes because any story like this is going to have a few, but rather highlight the absence of something I love to go on about in my other vids on the channel. In each of Succession, Silo, The Last of Us and Star Trek, there are big themes woven into the narrative. Fundamentally, the shows are about something. They're aiming to comment on some part of the human condition or experience. Let me go. You've just come after her. But Hijack doesn't. No themes to be seen here, other than perhaps the accidental ones of personal versus collective good. Aboard the landing. So this theme section that I'd normally have at the end of my videos is going to be pretty short. There aren't any. So, in summary, I do want to congratulate Hijack for being an original story on our screens, of which we see far too few. It's in a genre I love, and it's seeing commercial and critical success. On balance, though, it just wasn't really for me. Am I the outlier here? Maybe. But did anything I talk about niggle with you too? If so, let me know in the comments. Sorry. One second, one. One second, I left something. And God, I hate having to do this, being British and everything. We can't abide outright asking for things. But this is a new channel and it's desperately reliant on the cruel mistress that is the YouTube algorithm. And you can make a massive difference by liking this vid. So if you did feel like it, I'll be forever grateful. And before I sign off, if this is your first time on the channel and you're wondering about who the hell I am and what I've done, I talk about it at the end of my Top Gun Maverick film. Link here and in the description. Next up might be a look at Dune and what my take would be on the upcoming sequel. Catch you next time.